Hello. And uh, thank you all for coming back to the Salt Marsh um, for my, one of my, or my first of the two fall presentations that I do here. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Arthur Bergeron, and I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are 70 of us, 7-0, which means everybody kind of gets to really do what they really like doing. Um, because you don't have to figure out anything else because you can ask somebody else if you've got a different issue. So all I do is elder law. And I've been coming here now for, mm, I think, about five years doing these presentations. In the spring, I try to do general ones, Elder Law 101 and 102. And in the fall, something more specific. So I'm doing two this fall, one about irrevocable trusts, and the other, uh, which will be later in the fall, and I don't know when. I'm supposed to know this, but I don't. Um, will be regarding the two devices that you can use, um, uh, uh, um, a certain kind of annuity, and these things called D4C pooled trust if you need to qualify for mass health. The subtitle of the next one is, you can always qualify for mass health. You can always qualify, right? I was just talking to a couple with $3 million. They can qualify for mass health, right? So you can all, you know, there may be prices involved in doing that, but you can always do it. So today, we're gonna to talk about irrevocable trust. Probably the most common question that I get when I see people, um, actually the most common request that I get is people so often come in and they say, I want an irrevocable trust. And I'll say, well, why is that? And they'll say, well, because everybody's got an irrevocable trust and I really need to protect my money and everybody told me I need an irrevocable trust. So. Um, that's not necessarily true, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to talk about the cases where you do need it, um, and then we'll talk about if you've got one and it may and it has some what has to be in there, and then if you've got an existing one that's irrevocable and there's something in there that isn't good, what can you do? Because contrary to what you would think, you can actually change an irrevocable trust. Who knew? Who knew? So we're going to talk about all of those things. So, um, you've all met my friends Frank and Mary and their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., if you've seen my presentations. And, and once again, they're in, this, in this presentation, Frank's dead. He's now just a picture. Um, usually we talk more about the both of them. So we're gonna focus on Mary, because the Mary, if Mary's the only one alive, then Mary's the, the one that might really have an interest in an in irrevocable trust. If the couple is there, and we'll talk about that later, it's really unnecessary. So um, Mary's goal is very simple. She wants to stay at home until she dies. She wants to be buried in the backyard. She wants to leave as much as possible to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. She'd rather not leave it, although she likes the island home. She'd rather not leave it to the island home. She'd rather not leave it to the Department of Revenue. You know, she'd rather leave it to her kids. Uh, her assets, now, now this is a presentation that I'm doing in several nursing homes, so, or in several um, councils on aging, so obviously that house figure isn't one that works well in uh, Nantucket, but you're gonna find that everything that I'm saying applies. So in, the, in these numbers, Mary's house is worth $400,000. It's a really small Nantucket house. Um, she's got an IRA worth $200,000. She's got bank accounts worth two hundred. dollars So she doesn't have a lot of assets, but she's not broke. And she's got social security income of $2,000 a month in addition to whatever she's making off of the IRAs and the other stuff. So that's Mary. And, her, her, and she's never going to a nursing home. She's absolutely positive she's going to shoot herself before she goes to the nursing home. Now, I have been practicing now for 42 years. I can't tell you how many people told me they were gonna shoot themselves. No one has shot themselves yet. So I get that you don't wanna go, but you kinda of wanna think about if just in case you wanna plan B, in case you don't shoot yourself, you know? And so Mary needs to be focusing on that. Now, Mary is concerned about the nursing home because this is what she thinks would happen if she went to the nursing home. You saw her assets. The nursing home cost, it actually here's a little higher than that, but the nursing home cost that we're using for today's purposes is $12,000 a month. Um, she knows that she has income of $2,000 a month. Remember that social security income? And so she's thinking that she's got this, uh, this, in, this burn rate, the rate at which she needs to use up her savings uh, if she's on private pay of, uh, of uh, a lot, of, of um, 144,000 minus 24,000 or $120,000 a year. So she figures if she gets stuck in a nursing home for five years, 
Remember, she had total assets that were worth $800,000. That was the house and the IRA and the cash. Well, they're going to shrink, she thinks, by $600,000, and therefore, um, which is five times 120. She's going to, they're going to shrink by 600, and she's only going to have $200,000 left. And so when she dies, all she's going to be able to give Peter, Paul, and Mary is $200,000. Now, before we go into the, the real analysis of this, so this is what would really happen if Mary were going into a nursing home and she had those assets. She would put on, she would, she would um, want to be applying for Mass Health, and so she would put on her application that she intends to return home. As long as she says that, the house is no longer a countable asset. It is lienable so that once she's in the nursing home, Mass Health can put a lien on the house to get reimbursed for whatever it is that, that MassHealth pays on her behalf at the nursing home, but it's not countable, so she can have the house and still qualify for MassHealth. She's gonna take the rest of her money and she's gonna do one of these two things with it. She's either gonna put the money into a D4C pooled trust. These are trusts that are operated by nonprofits. There are five of them in Massachusetts. And by federal law, if, if there are assets that she has put into that pooled trust, those assets are not countable as hers um, while she's alive and on Medicaid. In most states, uh, a transfer into one of these pooled trusts is subject to the five-year look-back period, but not in Massachusetts. So she could literally take all of her money and put it into the pooled trust and the next day qualify for Mass Health. A, se a second thing that she could do would be to purchase a specific kind of annuity. And we're going to a, a, an annuity that calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than her life expectancy. I'm going to go into much more detail about both of those in the next seminar. But the bottom line is, once she has done that, said she's go going to return home, taken all of her money uh, that is over $2,000 and put the money into these things, the next day she can qualify for MassHealth. Now, once she has qualified for MassHealth, MassHealth will have a lien on the assets that she has put in other places. She'll have, they'll have a lien to the extent that there are remaining payments due on that annuity after her death. MassHealth will have a lien on them. To the extent that the money is in the pooled trust, MassHealth will have a lien on them. And they'll have a lien on the house. So then you would say to yourself, well, so why am I doing this? Why is Mary going through this exercise if the end result is the same? Well, this is the reason. If Mary is in the nursing home on private pay, she is paying, we're, we're assuming, about $12,000 per month. Once she has qualified for Mass Health, however, if she's in that very same bed in that very same nursing home, she's there on the Mass Health rate, not the private pay rate. While the Mass Health rate varies from nursing home to nursing home, and also varies depending on how much, how much care you need. MassHealth actually has a chart that has 10 different levels of care based on the estimated number of nurse minutes per day that you get while you're in the nursing home. It's great, it's a great bureaucratic chart. And, the, and they pay more depending on how many nurse minutes you need. That said, typically the MassHealth rate for that bed pretty much across Massachusetts is gonna be around $7,000 a month, right? So that by qualifying for MassHealth, uh, Mary has cut the rate, the, 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 the nursing home rate from $12,000 a month to $7,000 a month. And remember her income, which whether she's on Mass Health or not, is gonna, we're assuming is being paid to the nursing home, is $2,000 a month. So she has cut, by being on Mass Health, she has cut her burn rate, the rate at which her savings are deteriorating or being used up, from uh, $10,000 a month, remember 12 minus two, 12 the private pay minus two, to $5,000 a month, the mass health rate of seven minus two, right? So at, the, at that rate, Mary is only burning up money uh, at the rate of $60,000 a year, 5,000 times, times 12, $60,000 a year. And over those five years, Mary will only have used up $300,000. That is, the liens that Mass Health will collect after she dies, assuming that she dies on the fifth year plus a day, right, are only going to be equal to that much smaller amount so that she's going to have left over for, for Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., which was her goal, a lot more money than she thought. Now, I wanted to go through that in detail because, once again, so I do nothing but this. So I, I hear a lot of folks talk to me, and I hear many folks who call 
or who don't call, and somebody, and they later hear about it, and I, they, I say, why didn't you call? Well, it was too late. It was too late, they'll tell me. You know, I had all this money, and the five-year look-back period, I had to deal with that. It was too late, because they didn't know that they could do things and immediately qualify, and therefore get this benefit. So, the question then is, for Mary, the real question is, how can Mary, Mary save that other $300,000? Can she really save it all? so that at the end of the day, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. are getting all of the money. Um, well, there, she has two choices if she wants to save the money. She can get married, right? Or she can give it away. So I often tell people about number one. I say, you know, you're single. You can just get married, right? Nobody has done this yet. Actually, the only people who have done this are gay couples. I have you know, older folks who are gay and who've been living together forever. Right, and so now it's legal to get married, but they said, ah, it's the hell with it. You know, we're just gonna keep living together. What's the problem, right? And then somebody gets memory loss, has memory loss. Somebody has dementia, and now they're going, oh, what are we gonna do if we have, one of us has to go to the nursing home? And I'll tell them, I'll say, well, you know, what you wanna do is you wanna get married. And, and here's the reason. There's my friend Frank. We're pretending now that Frank is alive. If Frank and Mary were both alive, and they had those very same assets, remember that's that same list of assets, and Mary needed nursing home care, um, while Mary, to qualify for MassHealth, has to have less than $2,000 in countable assets. Frank, because he's the spouse and he's healthy, can have the house no matter what it's worth, no matter what it's worth, all you folks with those houses in Nantucket, you transfer the house to your spouse and you qualify for MassHealth, the house is safe, not leaned, not subject to any kind of, you know, you know, um, pay back by, to the mass health, no matter what the house is worth. You can just transfer it the house to Frank. Frank can keep the house. Frank can keep up to 100, this is an old figure, this is now wrong, 123,600 was the figure last year. This year I believe it's 125,400. But he can keep around that amount of money, around $125,000. Now, he has more than that, right? Remember, because their total assets were 200,000 in IRA and 200,000 in cash. So he has 400,000. So what Frank will do once he has all this money, and by the way, once again, for those of you who haven't been here before, transfers between spouses are not subject to the look back period. Everybody walks in thinking there's nothing we can do, there's a five year look back period. That is true as to gifts to anybody except your spouse. Right, so my gay couple, Till they get married, you can't do these transfers. That's subject to the look back period. But once you're married, the day after, you can. So, so Frank would, would then take the extra money, keep say $100,000, take the extra money and buy an annuity. As long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy. And if say Frank were 80, his life expectancy would be over 10 years, right? The purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. And Frank can have unlimited income. As the healthy spouse, he has asset limits, but he can have unlimited income. So the day after Frank buys the annuity, thereby reducing his cash or his other countable assets to below 125,000, Mary can qualify for mass health. So I'm just gonna mention one other thing about that annuity, because I can't remember if I mentioned it in another slide. No, I didn't. So the thing about that annuity, it, it used to be that if Frank had done that and Mary were then on mass health and Frank then died and the term of the annuity had not run out, so there was still more payments, that those payments could simply go to the kids. Under a regulation change that occurred last year, that changed. Under, under that regulation change, in that situation, if Mary's on mass health and Frank dies, and there were remaining annuity payments, MassHealth has a lien on those, which is why when we're advising clients on this, we simply tell them, make the annuity short, right? Buy, don't buy an annuity for your whole life expectancy. Buy it for like three years, four years, so that you can get all your money back faster, right? And therefore, if you then die, the money's still gonna be safe. Now, you know, your, your, your question would then be, by the way, but wait a minute, if I'm Frank and I'm getting all this money, I thought there was this cap to how much I could have, about $125,000. That is true, except the cap is only of significance until Mary qualifies for MassHealth. 
the day after she qualifies, Frank can have as much money as he wants. So the whole, the whole way to structure this is just to make sure that even with his annuity payments coming in, Frank stays below the magic number of 125,000 until Mary qualifies for Mass Health. So the only other thing that Frank would do is Frank would then change his will. Now he could also, he should, probably should have done that ahead of time, but at this point he could change his will because now he has all the assets and his will is now gonna say, when I die, everything that was going to go to Mary, and that was always their plan, one gave everything to the other, that's why Mary ended up with all this money. Instead of that, if Frank had said, when I die, everything that would have gone to Mary instead is gonna be held in trust for Mary's benefit, and I'm gonna name, say, one of the kids, or all of the kids as the trustee, and Frank then died owning those assets, they all would have been safe, non-countable and non-leanable. So, when, going back to where we started, if, if, if Mary were still married to Frank and Frank was still alive, these issues just wouldn't be relevant because Mary could just move stuff around at the last minute. So you wouldn't have to do all this advanced planning. But that's not our case. Our case is it's just Mary. So now what does she do? She can't, she's not gonna get married, she tells me. She can give it away uh, or she can put the money into an irrevocable trust if she wants to set to make the money safe The only thing she can do is give it away is give it away and wait five years That's the famous five-year look-back period if Mary owns an asset that she doesn't want to be to have be countable If she needs to qualify for mass health, she has to give it away and wait five years now The first alternative just giving it to the kids is certainly simpler Certainly simpler than putting any money into an irrevocable trust. She could give away everything that she has to the kids today, and five years and a day from today, all those assets would be safe. So for mass health purposes, it's a nice, clean way to do it. Now, one concern that people will raise for me, to me is, well, but isn't there, a, isn't there some limit on what I can give away? And the answer is no. The answer is no. We've talked about that before. There is this myth that if you give away more than $15,000 in a particular year to a particular person, it used to be 10,000, now it's 15, that something bad happens. But if, you, if somebody tells you that and you say, well, what is it that bad that happens? They can't tell you. And the reason is, nothing bad happens. You can just give away as much as you want. You can give your kids 100,000, you can give your kids a million dollars this year. There's no gift tax. There's no Massachusetts gift tax. The only exception is, if you have an estate that's worth more than $11 million. Now, every once in a while, I hit somebody that that's an issue, right? But for most people, this is not an issue because in addition to your federal ability for federal gift tax purposes to give money away at the rate of $15,000 per year per person, in addition to that, you can give away over your lifetime up to the federal exemption amount, which is now a little over $11 million, right? So you can give it away at any time, right, to any of the kids. Now, there may be some reasons why Mary doesn't want to do that, so she's going to need to weigh that out. Because remember, when she's thinking about this, it's not like she's about to go to the nursing home. If that's the case, time's already up, because she doesn't have the five years to give it away and make it through the look-back period. In that case, she's going to be stuck doing the other things that I had suggested, putting the money into the D4C pool trust or buying an annuity. So at, at this point, she's still healthy. Because by the time you've got serious dementia symptoms, time's up, you don't have five years anymore. So, so at this point, she's still healthy and she's saying, why am I doing this, right? Why am I losing control of things? This may never be of concern to me. And, and that's very legitimate, right? She, it, and, and Mary will tell me in that case, well, what if I just drop dead? And I'll say, that's the best solution. That's the goal, is to drop dead. You know, as you get older, you're not afraid. You, what you want to do is drop dead, right? You know you're going to die. The only question is how, right? So dropping dead, is, that's another alternative, you know? If you're sure you're going to drop dead, you don't have to do any of this, right? But if you need a plan B, then, then you, you're thinking about it. So anyway, the things that Mary needs to think about, think about well, what are, the tax con what are the tax consequences? For example, she has that IRA. Right? In order for her to give the money away, she's gonna to have to cash in the IRA, pay the taxes on the money, and then give the money away, which she may hate doing. Now, you know, in, and that's a thing you have to weigh out. Now, something I'll just mention, though, is remember, A, it's the IRA money, right? Which means it isn't your money, 
right? It's somebody else's, and they're going to give it to you when you ask, but at that point, you're going to have to pay the taxes. Or if, you're, if you leave it to your kids, and they go to ask for it, then they're going to pay the taxes. Except that your kids are probably going to pay more in taxes than you are, because chances are they're in a higher tax bracket, or at least some of your kids are. So often, when you're trying to kind of figure out what money do you give away in general versus what money do you keep as a senior, keep the, the tax deferred money. Uh, or, or cash in the, ta if you keep the tax deferred money, you don't pay the tax. If you cash in the tax deferred money, you're paying less tax on that money than you would if you had kept the money for your kids, right? So you may not be doing them any favor by keeping the money. So there's that. There's the capital gains issue. Of course, the major issue here. If you bought a house here in the early 90s, and now you've got that same house, and boy, it's not worth what it was in the early 90s, right? And so now there's this, and if, and if you sell the house, at least you get a capital gains exemption, a $250,000 exemption, if you've been living in the house for two of the previous five years. If you give it to your kids, though, and they sell the house, they don't get that exemption, right? So what you really want to do, ideally with the house, you want to hold it until you've died so that the so-called tax basis of the property will jump to the date of death. And then when the kids sell the property, they only pay a tax on the capital gain. And the capital gain is the difference between what they sell it for and the tax basis. And if you give your kids the property, you're giving them your tax basis, what you bought it for in the 1990s. If you keep it until you die and it's in your estate, it, the, the basis jumps to the date of death value. So the strategy typically is to keep the house until you die, especially, by the way, if you're married. You keep the house until you die. Ideally, you make sure that it's in your name at the time of your death, so that when you die, your spouse gets the, your spouse gets the house. The basis in the property jumps to the date of death value. Your spouse then sells the house without paying any capital gains tax and moves to a state where there's no estate tax, and now he's avoided all the tax. That's kind of like the, the game. But now Mary doesn't have the ability to do that, right? Frank's dead. So she just got this house. So one way that she can do that is by transferring the property to, to the kids and keeping something called a life estate in the property. We've talked about this a little bit before. What is a life estate? A life estate is complete control of the property until the moment of your death. And for IRS purposes, um, if you do that, if you give away the, the, remainder, the remaining interest in the property before you die, it's called the remainder, but keep the life estate, for estate tax purposes, you still own the property at death which means it gets included in your estate, which means the basis jumps to the date of death value, so when the kids go to sell the property, they don't pay the capital gains tax. But for mass health purposes, that, that, that remainder interest that you gave your kids, the, at five years after you've given it to them, no longer counts if you need to qualify for mass health. You're, you, so, the, so if Mary gives her house away but keeps a life estate, just gives the house to the kids, no irrevocable trust, keeps the life estate, five years after she's done that, needs to qualify for Mass Health. Mass Health will, will, will not count the value of the life estate um, as a countable asset because it's still her home. She's going to say she intends to return home. They'll put a lien on her life estate. Um, and so if the house gets sold while she's alive, Mass Health will be entitled to a piece. But when she dies, her life estate evaporates, poof. And therefore, so does the lien, poof. And the kids now own the house, lien free and tax free, right? The basis has jumped to the date of death value. They can now just go sell the house. So you can just, you can just give them the house, right? Um, if you keep a life estate, you're also not penalizing them in terms of their, their, their losing this benefit of, of having that jump in the basis. Um, and remember, we just talked about the whole fact that if you give them this, there's no gift tax to you. And the receipt of a gift, like the receipt of an inheritance, is not income. So if you give them these things, they're not paying any income tax on any of the stuff that you're giving them, okay? So, so are there other issues? Well, the first one, of course, is will they give it back? Because you're not really giving them the property, right? Mary doesn't want to just give the kids the property and then live on $2,000 a month for the rest of her life. She wants to know that if there's an issue, she can get the money back. And, and so she's got to trust that the kids are going to give the money back, right? That's number one. Two. Do the kids have their own problems? Because if you give something to someone, at the moment they get it, it's theirs. The law of gifts is 
that if I have $100 and I have the donative intent to give it to you, and I give you that $100 bill, um, at that moment that I give it, and you accept it, at the moment I give it to you, it's yours. So if the next day I call and say, I, I like take it back. I want that $100 back. You can't have it, right? You can't sue somebody and say, I want the gift back. That's the, sig the legal significance of a gift, is if it's a completed gift, the other person really owns it, right? So, and what that means is, if the other person really owns it, that means their creditors can sue and get to it. And if there's a divorce, the angry spouse can make that part of what's included in the pot of money that's going to get divided up, right? Because it's really, you've given it to them. You've given the property to Peter or to Paul or to Mary Jr. That money is now in play. Or if the child has a disability, say the child needs to qualify for mass health, right? Well, now they've got these assets. So now they can't qualify, right? So there may be reasons why you don't want to just give it to them. Those are the reasons, or there may be reasons, or if these aren't issues, you may feel comfortable. Many, many people have a child, typically a daughter, the sons are, yeah, but, but the daughter, that you can just give them the money. You know it's going to be okay, right? And that's simple and it's cheap, right? In terms of all the legal mumbo jumbo that you don't have to do. But if that's not the case and you're married, then you have to consider giving it to an irrevocable trust. Now, um, what is an irrevocable trust? First, what is a trust? A trust is, the, is a relationship. It's, a trust is not a separate legal person, the way like a corporation is, or a limited liability company. There are these legal things that, that live forever and that, and that are real individual people for legal purposes. A trust is a relationship between two kinds of people. The trustee, who is the legal owner of something for purposes of dealing with the rest of the world, so if I'm dealing with, if I want to buy a property from the trustee, I just want a signature from the trustee because they are the legal owner of that property, right? But they are the trustee not for themselves but for the benefit of some other people, the beneficiaries. And, and, and a, in a trust, you can actually be a trustee and also be a beneficiary, but you can't be a trustee and be the only beneficiary because if you are, there's no trust. It just means you own it because that's what, when you own something, that's exactly what you own it for. You own it for the benefit of yourself. Right? So a trust is a, a relationship. And a, a gift into a trust, um, unless the trust says otherwise, is, is a revocable gift. Right? If I give something to a trust that is a revocable trust, what that means is that I have the power to revoke the gift, take the money back. That's, a revo that's what a revocable trust is. Revocable means I can take them, I, the grantor, the person who put the money into the trust, can take it back at any time. An irrevocable trust is one where I can't take the money back, okay? So the trust that you're putting the money into, if, you, if for mass health purposes you want that money to be non-countable after five years, has to be irrevocable because you can't have the ability to get it back again, right? Um, you can't, as the courts have said, and this is actually a line you regularly see in these cases all around the country, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Everybody would love to put their assets in a place where MassHealth won't count them, but they've still got control over them. You can't do that. And if you are looking at a trust, at your own trust, if you have one, or if you're trying to th think of what you'd want to have in a trust, tell yourself, this is the rule, right? The closer you get to the kind of, to any kind of control over those assets that some judge could say means that you still have control over the assets, means you've tried to have your cake and eat it too and the assets are going to be countable. Or, in the words of the federal statute, this is right out of the federal Medicaid law in the section dealing with trusts, if there are any circumstances under which payment from the trust could be made to or for the benefit of the individual, the assets count. The assets are still countable, right? That's the standard. And judges have said, you know, if the trust, the, there's the, the first and kind of most well-known case in Massachusetts, the judge literally said, if the trustee has what he called a peppercorn's worth of discretion, if there is any way that the trustee can, following the trust rules, without breaking the trust rules, Use the money for the benefit of the older person, for the beneficiary. As far as mass health is concerned, the assets are still countable. So that's the standard. Now, that said, <clears throat> let me start off by saying 
This is a safe, irrevocable trust under current law. I know this is safe because our firm litigated this trust last year and won. We went all the way to the Supreme Judicial Court in Massachusetts. Medicaid had said there were th some things about this that were no good, and the Supreme Judicial Court agreed with us, right? So the, a wonderful attorney, by the way, if you, need, if you have one of those cases, I don't do those. I have a person named Lisa Neely, tremendous. She does that stuff. So in that irrevocable trust, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Jr., are the trustees. I should have in these slides always used Mary Jr. because it's the same name, but I forgot, okay? So it's Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. are the trustees. Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. are the only beneficiaries. So Mary Sr. is not a beneficiary. Distributions can be made to Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. in the discretion of the trustees or of one of the trustees while Mary is alive, right? So in other words, the trustees of the trust, now the money is all in the trust, and so is the house, and the trustees have the discretion at any time to take money out and give it to themselves or to give it to any one of them. Um, at the end, after Mary dies, the trustees are supposed to liquidate the property and distribute to all of the kids. And, in the, and regarding the house, Mary deeded the remainder interest to the irrevocable trust and kept the life estate. That trust worked. Mary then went to the nursing home MassHealth challenged some of this and went all the way to the Supreme Judicial Court, and this all worked, okay? Will that work in five or 10 years? I don't know that, because the rules that are in effect when you're applying for MassHealth are the latest rules. They're not the rules that were in effect when you set up the trust. That's the reason why many of you may, very, may have trusts that all worked great when you set them up 10 years ago. The question is, have some, any of those rules changed as of today. So I'm going to kind of talk about some of those potential issues of concern in a second. But first, I'm just going to talk about, so if you're creating one of these trusts, first of all, how do you make sure that you're protecting Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., right? Because, because if, if, the, if they are the beneficiaries of this trust, and they have the ability to get money out of the, tr out of the trust, how do we make sure that a creditor of theirs can't order them to get their money out. Or that the, the, the spouse that you never liked in the first place, the daughter-in-law you never liked, who is now doing, going through divorce, can't get her probate judge to say those assets should be counted as part of this whole deal, right? Or how do you make sure if Peter or Paul or Mary Jr. is trying to qualify for mass health, that some mass health worker doesn't disqualify them because they're the beneficiaries of all of this money? Um, a couple of ways of doing that, right? One would be to specify regarding distribution to the kids while Mary is alive, that there's some maximum distribution per year. And that way you're not protecting all of the money, but you're at least limiting the danger to just that maximum distribution. A second way is to have multiple trustees. This is the most common way, right? So you say in the trust that no distribution can be made to any one child without, the, without the, 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 the approval of at least two of the three trustees, assuming that all three of them are trustees. So that way, if I'm the judge and I'm representing Paul's wife, in a, or, or I'm the, and I'm deciding on whether Paul's wife in the divorce should be able to, whether I should be able to force out his share, right, so that it can be included in the, in the, in the, uh, in the divorce settlement is because the judge only in that case would have the power to order Paul as a trustee to make a distribution to himself. And because the trust would say at least two trustees have to agree to that distribution, therefore Paul's wife couldn't attack it and Paul's creditors couldn't attack it. And if Paul were trying to qualify for mass health, those assets wouldn't be countable. So you wanna be concerned about that. And then you wanna make sure that you're protecting Mary, right? What if Mary made a mistake? What if Mary made a mistake? What if she put all the money in the trust and she named the daughter, Mary Jr. as the trustee, right? Always the safest bet, name the daughter. But it turns out now Mary is, you know, the, sometimes this happens, right? So now Mary's the trustee of the trust and there's this big pile of money and Mary's got some financial problems. And so she's not gonna like steal the money, but maybe she's not that excited if Ma says that she needs some of this money to distribute it to herself and give the money back to, and then give the money back to her mother, right? And, and so now Mary Sr. is concerned about this because Mary Sr. really would like to be able to use some of that money. Oh, and by the way, <clears throat> you would think 
going back to the trust that I said is the one that you know works, that if there were a trust that gave children the ability to give money to themselves and then turn around and give it right back to their parent, that that might be suspect. And somebody, some judge might, some Medicaid person might say, well, geez, you know, that, maybe he's trying to have her cake and eat it too. Well, that was the reason why the case went all the way to the Supreme Judicial Court, because that's exactly what Medicaid said. And the Supreme Judicial Court said, no, nope. As long as the trust says that it's the trustees that make the decision as to whether or not they can give themselves the money, it isn't Mary, it isn't the senior who's doing it, that even though they can give it back, that's okay. Because the court reasoned, if Mary had simply given them the money, they could have always given it back, but the gift would have still been considered to be valid, right? So, so that's, that's not an issue. So, so getting back to Mary's problem, she's worried that Mary, maybe the person she names isn't going to make a distribution. So um, maybe she wants to retain the power to remove a trustee and name another one. She can do that. We know that she can do that. Maybe she wants to say any one of the children can require a distribution to themselves up to some amount of money so that you know if you're having problems with one of them who wants to keep the pot really big, you have this option of the other kids being able to make a distribution to themselves, right? Um, maybe, so there are, not, there are a number of other kind of possibilities regarding this, but I guess that's the concept. There, you, if you're mayor, you, you want to make sure that if there is an issue to the greatest extent possible, you're still going to be able to get somebody to distribute the money to themselves and turn around and give it back to you, okay? Um, keeping the use of the house. Um, we were just talking, oh, in the trust, what you may not, what you, what you may want to not do and I think a lot of these older trusts have done this, is in, where it, the older trust, instead of actually transferring, deeding a remainder interest in the property to the trustees, but keeping a life estate, many of the older trusts, the older person would have simply transferred the entire interest in the house to the trustees, but kept the right to live in it, rent free, no cost, right? Those you could be getting into trouble with. Right? In, in the case that I was just talking about that went before the Supreme Judicial Court, the court was like, well, you know, the question is, so is there a, va is there a real value to that? Right? And therefore, didn't Mary really keep some of that value in the house? So if you've got, if you've got that kind of trust, you may have a concern. You want to make sure, th these used to be extremely common, that, 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 that assets would be transferred in the into the trust, but that the senior would keep all of the right to trust income. These are the cases that have led to no end of problems. No end of problems. Because the question is, who determines what's principal and what's income? Right? And what if the trustee has the ability, because typically trustees have very broad power in terms of how they're handling their assets. What if the trustee, for example, and this was a case that was used by Medicaid, or an example, they said the trustee, it was a trust where the, trust, the, the older person could only get income. But the trustee was not limited uh, or did, was not prohibited from buying an annuity. So the Medicaid said, well, the, the, the trustee in that case could just take some of, the, some of the principal, right, which he can't distribute, and go buy an annuity with it, right, for Mary's benefit. How about that? Because Mary's entitled to all the income. And an annuity is just income. Remember, we talked about that earlier. That's the reason why, in all cases, you can qualify for mass health, because you can turn assets into income streams. An annuity is just income. So there are all these issues that, that show up regarding uh, irrevocable income-only trusts, right? So you may want to be concerned about that. No loans, no loans. This used to be very common, that you, people would create these irrevocable trusts and no, Mary's not the beneficiary, but the trustee has the right to make loans. And it would be as, inno as, as innocuous as la that. Among the trustee powers is the right to make loans. And what is implied is in there is that to anybody, including Mary, including Mary. But of course, if you're making a loan to your mother, you know, and you're not, are you going to go collect against her? Certainly not while she's in the nursing home, right? You're going to make her pay it back? So the courts have said, no, if, if, if the senior still has the right to get loans from this pile of money, for all intents and purposes, it's still theirs. It's, it's somebody trying to have their cake and eat it too. Here's a really, and, and, and this one has been, was used, has been used a lot and is really frowned upon. Keeping the power 
over the distributions to others. So Mary has transferred all the money to this irrevocable trust, and, these other, and the kids are the trustees, and the kids are the only beneficiaries, but no distribution can be made to a beneficiary without Mary's consent. So as a practical matter, Mary can kind of play around with that now. Mary still has the power over the money and the kind of picking and choosing. Well, you know, I'm only going to give it to you if you promise that you're going to give me the money right back. You know, so this is the kind of provision that, that courts, that's a, the question is, are you trying to have your cake and eat it too in those cases? Which of course in those cases, the senior was. They were trying to keep control of the money while putting it into trust. Um, you don't want to be the trustee if you're married. You don't want to be one of the co-trustees. Uh, you want it to be somebody else, a third party. But once again, you, want, you can leave yourself with the right to change trustees. Here's the, the most obscure one that I'm just going to mention to you. Um, so in many of these trusts, um, once again, tack, folks were trying to, lawyers were trying to help their clients make sure that while for mass health purposes, the assets that you put in there were safe, that for tax purposes, the assets that were in, in there were still considered to be yours, so-called grantor taxable trusts, because for various reasons. And one way to do that for tax purposes was to leave a provision in that said, that in this case, that Mary would retain the power to designate a nonprofit organization during her lifetime that could receive the assets, some of the assets. Well, in the course of the case that I was just describing to you that we did last year, the court brought up the fact that MassHealth had brought up the fact that 25% of the nursing homes in Massachusetts are owned by nonprofits, or in your case, the town, right? And so the court said, well, in that case, if you're, if you're in the nursing home and the nursing home is owned by a nonprofit and Mary has kept the right to, to use the money to designate it for a nonprofit, she should still have to pay the nursing home because the nursing home is owned by a nonprofit. The court pointed that out <coughs> without deciding the question because MassHealth had, had raised this issue kind of late in the appeals process. And there's a rule that when you're before the Supreme Court on appeal, you can only argue about the stuff that you raised as the basis of the appeal, and they hadn't raised that issue, right? But it's out there. So if you've got a trust that's got one of those provisions, eh, you may want to try to get rid of it. Um, which leads to a question, so what if you have one of these trusts and it has one of these kind of offending provisions, and it's irrevocable, and it's unamendable. You just read the trust and it says it can't be amended. Well, here's something you probably didn't know. You can actually amend an irrevocable trust even when it says that it's unamendable, um, through something called a non-judicial settlement agreement. This is something that has, was, became allowable uh, when Massachusetts adopted something called the Uniform Probate Code. This is pretty obscure, about three or four years ago. Uh, up until that time, you could always amend an unamendable trust if the judge said it was OK. So if there was a provision of the trust that you, that you thought was really didn't work, you could go to the judge, to a probate judge, and if, you, if the judge was convinced that this particular section of the trust was like impeding the real beneficial, the benefits of the trust for the parties, and if the parties all agreed, then the judge could bless it and say, okay, I'll allow that change. And what the Uniform Probate Code says is that if that's the case, if a judge could do that, as long as certain people agreed, uh, as long as all of the interested parties who in that case would have assented, otherwise agree, they can modify this, the existing trust in any way that a court could have modified it. So if there is a problem with your trust, don't think that there is no way to remedy it. That's all that I'm saying. I mean, I'll often have people come in and say, oh, what can I do, you know? Um, so what would be the effect on you if you did that, if you changed an existing trust? So more than five years ago, Mary put all of her assets into this trust, and it's irrevocable, and there are a couple of provisions in it that at this point, under current law, she's saying, eh, I think this would be a problem today, right? So she wants to change it. So my advice to her in that case would be, so the goal of life is to sleep well at night. So if it's really bothering you, then change it. Because changing it by getting rid of the sections that you think might be of concern um, doesn't affect it's, it's legitimacy if it's otherwise legitimate. So if five years have gone by and the section that you're worried about, it turns out, is not going to be a problem, 
and then you do this change, and then you apply for Mass Health the following, because maybe you need to the following year, right? Well, the change will not have taken effect yet. For, it, won't, it won't have been five years since the change was made, but the court may find that you were worried about nothing, right? And that, the, and that the original document was okay, and so it's still okay, right? So there's nothing bad about doing these changes. What's good about doing the changes is that you can be sure that five years after you did the changes, you've remedied the problem, right? So if you've got a concern about that trust, all I'm saying is talk to your lawyer about it. And if it is a concern, if you're losing sleep about it and you want to fix it, just understand there's a way to fix it. Right? Don't, don't assume that you're just stuck. And, and my suggestion to clients is, and get it checked every five years, because the law changes. Several of the concerns that I just raised regarding what can be in the trust weren't concerns 10 years ago. They are concerns now because the law changes. So you may want to think about that. So the goal of all of this is to sleep well at night. None of this is of concern to you. That's great. Um, if any of it is con of concern, then you, you may want to try to do something about it. Um, if you've got any questions about any of this, um, and, or, or you've, you've, you're, you're, you're hearing me talk, but I, wa I talk too fast, you know, I have that habit, I'm a lawyer, I talk too fast. You can always watch it again. Um, I'm, I really appreciate the fact that Nantucket Cable rebroadcast these uh, a lot. Um, and also you can see it on, on, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, Frank, Elder Law Frank and Mary which has all of the seminars that we've, that we've done over the last about five years. So if there's any an issue, you can always go back to that. Any questions regarding any of this? Yes, sir. You have an irrevocable trust. Yeah. You set it up, you say six years go by, and then you add some assets to it. Mm -hmm. Does that chance start a new five-year look back? So the question is, you, if you've created an irrevocable trust and put assets into it and five years have gone by, or three years have gone by, or whatever, and then you want to add assets. What's the effect? And the effect is that every, every, every gift has its own five-year clock attached. So if six years after you, you created the trust, you drop in new assets, those new a the transfer of those assets, that gift is subject to a new five-year clock. But you have not changed the, the, the safeness right, of the other assets, which were transferred more than five years before. Right? So, so every, every transfer, whether it's to an individual or to a trust, an irrevocable trust, has its own clock attached. That's the best way to kind of think about it. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much for your attention here. I'm going to stay for a few minutes in case anybody has individual questions. And then I'll, if you want to come in a couple of months, we're going to talk to you about why it is that everybody can always qualify for Mass Health. And we're going to go into those issues in more detail. Thank you very much. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Boom. <clears throat>